as well. I get camera shy. Uh, uh, I can't believe I had to speak. <laughs> poor girl. Poor Grace. She has to speak into a mic. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? <laughs> they've asked nothing of me except to read and to talk. <laughs> and they've sent me to Peru. <laughs> Foucault argues that the ways in which people consistently speak about a certain topic can, over time, constitute reality. Discursive practices is thus not just a transcription or evaluation of an outside reality, but rather produces it. In the context of tourism, we can see how certain intangible tourism imaginaries can become manifested over time. In this quote from The Living Inca Town by Caroline Galka, we can see how the ways we talk about place is how we experience it. The ways in which we engage with the making and unmaking of indigeneity in the Andes ultimately makes and unmakes indigeneity. We have found land to be inherently indigenous, but also capable of being re-indigenized. Period. Period. I touch the stone with my hands, following the line which was as undulating and unpredictable as a river, where the blocks of stone were joined. In the dark street, in the silence, the wall appeared to be alive. The lines I had touched between the stones burned out the palms of my hands. Grace, what was your favorite place to be in Peru? <laughs> um... One of the places that really spoke to me on our trip was when we went to visit Saxe Woman. What did you um, feel when we got there? I, I felt that when I walked into Saxe Woman, um, almost like the, the presence of the um, people that used to be there was still kind of like lingering. Like being able to like sort of like imagine what life was like in the past. At the same time, there was like a connection happening like with all of us like being there. It was a really special day. Yeah. I think that was the highest we'd been at that point. It was a trek getting up there, <laughs> even though it's only 15 yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah. Can um, you imagine doing that with a bunch of stuff on your back, though? No. Like, just... Did you have a favorite part of Sexy Woman? I remember Adam saying something like, why do I feel so free or something? Yeah, or he like... was saying that he felt like he was, like, standing a little taller. He was standing a little taller, yeah. and I told him it was because he wasn't surrounded by any buildings. Yeah. I wonder, you know, living there and building that place, how they must have felt. Cusco was the yeah. center of the world. Yeah. And Sex A Woman it was the top of the world. I thought it was really special to see the ink stones. Yeah. yeah. And I hadn't read Argatus all that much because when I was in the hospital, um, but I remember being sick as fuck. <laughs> I had just puked off the hospital balcony. <laughs> and I came back in. The hospital's cold. They leave all the doors open. I'm shivering. And I'm I'm sleeping on Emma's shoulder. And she starts reading me Argatus. Does the Inca allow them to live there? The father responds. The Incas are dead. But not this wall. If the owner is a miser, why doesn't the wall swallow him up? This wall can walk. It could rise up into the sky or travel to the end of the world and back. Aren't the people who live there afraid? How many lives have they passed by? Yeah. Do you think yeah. the stones remember us? Like, we're walking past the stones and it's like, oh, you know, they're a regular shape, they're big, they're, they're impressive, like, as they are. Um, but then we're going through the tour and then the guide is like, oh, like, don't you see, like, do you see the flower? Do you see the yeah. hummingbird? Do you see the puma? And it's like, I probably never would have noticed that, like, otherwise. But then all of a sudden she's like, well, do you see it? And I'm looking at him like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I see it. I do see it. I do see it. And that's insane that they, like, like, symbols are, like, built into the walls. It felt indigenous, you know, like, those stones... How long have they been there, you know? And it's just like, of course, that's made and it's put together. But for some reason, it feels very foundational, you know? It's like the same stones that like we're touching. We actually might not have been supposed to touch them. Um, like, I mean, someone licked them. <laughs> like the same. <laughs> that's crazy. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, 
How did you feel about Machu Picchu? What was your experience? <laughs> what was your experience? I, I kind of summarized for me like what the course is about, particularly yeah. the unmaking the and making, making um, of indigeneity because you know I had read Rice and I had read a bit mm. of Neruda and I was you know in the Rice reading it he, he talks a lot about the the narratives that were put on by different groups of people and each of the intentions that they had for Machu Picchu. And I liked what Rice said about Machu Picchu as a kind of a national yet empty symbol. Mm -hmm. And the emptiness is like where the unmaking and the making happens. And it's through the unknowing that like that things change and things, the meanings change. And I think yeah. how indigeneity plays a role in Machu Picchu because sometimes it feels like it doesn't exist there. Yeah, and, I, and definitely, like, I, I like that point about... Yeah, Machu Picchu is a really good example of, like, making and unmaking, because depending on who... I don't know who... Like, what the purpose is, you know? Whether that's, like, we're trying to represent national identity or we're trying to represent indigeneity or we're just trying to sell tourism, that, that all changes how we decide we're going to, um, like, talk about indigeneity. So we, we unmake what we know and then we remake it to fit a certain narrative that fits like our purposes. And, and, and a place like Machu Picchu that we don't know a lot about, it, it's easier, I think, to like, quote unquote, like create indigeneity in, in, in those ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about Neruda as well and um, at how he, as a non-Peruvian, mm -hmm. non-indigenous, in fact, Chilean man, <laughs> wrote these series of poems that, you know, have this huge renown and have undoubtedly helped the, the fame of Machu Picchu. Yeah. And yet he has no connection to these places and to indigeneity, but he tries to speak for it. The way that he talks about indigeneity in his poems, in my opinion, there's only a very few number of things that are alive in his poems. Mm. There's himself and there's Machu Picchu. Yeah. Indigeneity is found in the men who are dead mm -hmm. or awaiting their daily death. Yeah, Naruto talks a lot about that. Yeah, and there's it feels like there's a lot more life in the rocks than there is in man. Yeah. And I, th I thought it was interesting because... Um, our guide said that the Inca stones aren't really prominent at Machu Picchu. They're more prominent in places like Cusco mm -hmm. or Sexy Woman. Yeah. And just the the infrastructure and the, the architecture. Yeah, the techniques that were the used techniques, to build. Yeah. It says a lot about how important Machu Picchu was. Yeah. So it's interesting that we're putting this emphasis on it now. How is it possible that I feel nostalgia for a world that I never knew? How do you explain that a civilization capable of building this is wiped out to build? So I think to begin with, we started off with some foundational questions. Yeah. It started off with favorite places to be. And then I think we realized that was a little bit too uneducational. <laughs> so then we went with where have we found indigeneity? Is it up to us to find it or discern where or what it is? How are we as tourists, as students, complicit in making or unmaking indigeneity? Yes. So one of the ways that we've looked about that is, or one of the ways we've gone about trying to d decipher that is looking into the past. We visited a lot of ruins. So we went to Saxe Woman, we saw Machu Picchu, and, you know, we learned a lot about, like, historically what indigeneity meant. But there were a lot of places where, like, indigeneity was very alive, like, in the present. And I think the school was one of those. The school is definitely one of those places where I think, without a doubt, you know, we were given an, an example of future indigeneity mm -hmm. and present indigeneity. One of the one of the points to your question is like is it like our place like to define then to like like look for it um but when like places like like Kusi Kaswe, like exist where they're teaching indigeneity like to the future generations 
like I think that we should pay closer attention to how how they're like defining indigeneity what their relationship is to the space that they are they're in um and, and we saw quite a lot of interesting things um when we were there the connection that the kids had like to the space that we're in I think that like like because he being where it is um is is just a big part in in the education that goes on there they're teaching kids about like traditional like creation stories and and celebrating holidays that we you know we saw like in Tirami and also just traditional practices we saw a lot of weaving we're learning about Andean Cosmo living Mm, rather than Andean Cosmo vision which I think is interesting yeah the redefining of indigeneity is something that we we saw a lot there as Um, well we saw a lot of breaking out of gender roles Mm -hmm. they specifically talked about that with the weaving where they're like you know what we teach we teach boys and girls you know yeah and I think going to the school was such a stark difference to going to the ruins you know Mm -hmm. I think that was really one of the first times where we looked into the present and the future for indigeneity rather than looking in the past because going into the ruins going to Machu Picchu even going to Sexy Woman and reading the text even these are tools of looking to the past looking for traces of indigeneity rather than looking for indigeneity I think meeting him really put the pieces together for me about how community oriented PSAC is mm, yeah. and even further than that how how community oriented indigeneity is yeah. because in in this way learning about indigeneity it's one way to be involved in the community and pr- having those practices being part of the community is indigeneity mm-hmm. it's it's a mutual negotiation yeah I think it's important that we look into the future and we look not just at things that are past or things that are material, like Machu Picchu or Sexy Woman. And it, I think it's important to look at the people. Listen to a story, <laughs> you know, where like when they're sharing like their testimonies and they're sharing their their experiences as, as indigenous peoples, like like the the authors like they they're like well you know what what is our intention of 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 sharing this you know and and i think they said something along the lines of like we we want to bring to light like the conditions of of being an indigenous person you know um and like these like like when we look at the past we kind of like when we look at the past to like define indigeneity we're kind of like separating it almost from like the present whereas like it's something that's still alive and it's living and like although that we can we can draw lessons and we can draw like histories from the past uh, it's important that these all like past present and future like all kind of like intermingle in this like definition of it i think that's the problem with much pichu that's... it's a one-sided story mm-hmm. we don't have the peopled story we only have the material story we have indigeneity in the architecture in the infrastructure in the way that things are set up but we don't have indigeneity of the people who lived there without people a place doesn't become a space <laughs> and i think kusikau say the school there's indigeneity that's curated by people and i think that's what's missing mm. from places like machu picchu yeah. and sexy woman sure we can have information and we can have tours, and we can have extremely enlightening experiences there. But there's a difference. Mm. And that's where I think Neruda was wrong. He was looking for the material. He was looking for the indigeneity in the material. And in that way, he spoke for indigenous people. Yeah. Whereas in the first place, he should have been looking for the people. Yeah, I think that's why these like testimonies are so important as well. Steps had been built over the site of Gregoria and Asinta's home, and no signs remained that it had ever existed. The steps were later torn down to provide space for a road. Today, the spot is marked by a curve in the highway between Cusco and Juancaro. Time has erased their tracks, and if Ricardo and Carmen had not retained the words on paper, the wind would have taken them, 
Like it has, it has those of so many other Gregorios and Asuntas. How should we close this? How should we close this? What have you learned about indigeneity while you've been in Peru? I think John would say, not much. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that one. And I think it's okay not to answer it. To be honest, I think that's what I've learned. I think it's okay not to answer some things. This pain of return works like a house with two doors. Towards the future and towards the past. Seen from there, the present is a mere place of passage.